everyone. This is Sophia Smallstorm, and I am back again. I'm doing podcasts at a very high、uh, speed now. I was dormant for a few weeks there with some very strange laryngitis, but my voice is coming back, and I have people that I wanted to interview before and absolutely couldn't, and they've been very patient. So today I'm bringing you Joseph Atwill, and I learned of Joe.、Uh, I think it was a year or more ago when this DVD was premiered in LA、uh, at the Lemley Theater, and it was called.、Uh, this actually I shouldn't call it a DVD. It was a documentary called Caesar's Messiah, subtitled "The Roman Conspiracy to Invent Jesus." And Wow, I didn't know who this guy was or what he was about, and I honestly expected that it would be some kind of semi-mainstream namby pamby thing. I bought it, and I was surprised. It was actually quite good. I also thought, in some ways, it was holding back, but I never knew that I would ever figure out how or why the person, who, the people who made it. Were had made it the way they had, and I was actually I took it over to a friend's house and I made her watch it, and she really didn't know what to say. So、uh, amazingly, I now know Joe Atwill, and so will you. After this interview, so I will read you the、um, back of the DVD. But let's say hello to Joe first. How are you, Joe? I'm fine, Sophia. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. I think you are quite a personality and a thinker, and you've gone out on a limb. You've really like taken on something that most people would just shut up about, even if they had these thoughts and had done this research. But I like the way you conduct yourself in your debates and interviews. You're very relaxed and、um, very kind of even-handed when others can get quite riled up because people are emotionally attached to their religious concepts,、uh, wouldn't you say? Absolutely,、um, and I just take a, a, a completely different position. I, I don't really,、um, you know, have any、uh, emotional connections to Christianity or, or to any of the analysis that that you know is subsequent.、Uh, To my、uh, work in the Gospels, and I just base it on the actual text. I don't really、um, need to go into fantasies or conjecture. I just try to keep my analysis、um, within the, the text themselves, and, and therefore, it's.、Uh, I think I, I'm just at a, in a calmer place than a lot of people who、uh, choose to debate、uh, Christianity or Jesus Christ. Well. I、um, will read just a little bit from the back of the DVD so people get an idea of how you explained the nature of that documentary, and then we can go from there because I would like to、uh, get the conversation into the、uh, counterculture. I had interviewed Dave McGowan recently, and、uh, he was also. Writing, he has written extensively on this subject, but we're gonna. So we'll plan all this out. Sorry for me. Sorry about、uh, blab blabbering around a little bit. Okay, so from the back of the DVD, Caesar's Messiah. Seven of today's most controversial Bible scholars reveal their shocking conclusions about the origins of Christianity, based on the best-selling religious studies book by Joseph Atwill. This documentary shows that Jesus is not a historical figure. The events of Jesus's life were based on a Roman military campaign. His supposed second coming refers to a historical event that already occurred. The teachings of Christ came from the ancient pagan mystery schools, and the Gospels were written by a family of Caesars and their supporters, who left us documents to prove it. Dissecting the history and literature of this time. The scholars show that the Gospels are a sophisticated, pro-Roman, multi-layered allegorical text that could not have been written by simple Jewish fishermen. Noting that the history officially provided by the Church does not hold up to rigorous scrutiny, the scholars agree that Christianity was used as a political tool to control the masses of the day and is still being used this way today. Much like the ancient era from which Christianity emerged. We are currently on the brink of an immense paradigm shift, 
and studying this history can help us understand modern day politics and give us the much needed perspective for coming up with solutions to today's problems in order to create the better world that we envision. So that's a very interesting um, text on the back of this DVD. Uh, so Joe, uh, I just, I guess you can go ahead and explain to us why Christianity, this uh, feudalism vehicle, has um, now been transformed into counterculture and the new feudalism. Well, uh, Christianity um, had, a, you know, sort of a number of, uh, of uses for the um, imperial family of Rome. At the beginning, uh, it was um, the story of Jesus Christ, this peaceful Messiah, was just uh, a, um, a device to calm down the messianic movement uh, that was the legitimate one, which was completely militaristic and waged war against Rome. And so by coming up with the character Jesus Christ, they hoped to uh, basically head off any further rebellions. Um, the um, Wait, I'd like to just ask you, who were the groups that you call the Messianic movement attacking Rome? Right. In... Um, in the first century, there was a series of rebellions, and, and into the middle part of the second century, there was a series of rebellions by uh, Jews uh, against Roman colonization of Judea. And um, the, these rebellions began in what we would refer to as the year one, basically. The very beginning of the Christian era was when the rebellions began. Uh, and they concluded in uh, 135, 33, with the end of the Bar Kokhba Rebellion. Um, the movement that waged war against Rome uh, was messianic. In other words, uh, simply looked to a leader who would have the kind of divine relationship um, to God that David had. Um, David was the original Messiah. He was the prototype uh, God gave him the ability to defeat Goliath, and this was what the uh, Messianic zealots who wanted to end Roman control over Judea were looking for. So they were led by messiahs, or they looked to messiahs, and you can verify this by simply looking in the, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which is legitimate Hebraic literature, and you can see um, that uh, they were looking for a military leader who uh, would be in the lineage of David. Okay. So, so this was, um, uh, you know, the basis of the attempt by Rome to create a fictitious storyline that uh, incorporated the, the prophecies and uh, the character named Christ, um, but into a, a pacified context so that the people who came across uh, their Jesus Christ wouldn't be... Um, propelled to rebel against Rome, but rather they would be propelled to give to Caesar what is Caesar, and when they were insulted by Roman soldiers, they would turn the other cheek, and they would just get along with the Roman Empire in, um, uh, in the way that uh, the imperial family was hoping its, uh, you know, its colonized uh, areas would. So this was um, what... Uh, was uh, the, the motivation for the Flavian Caesars, and this is a family that succeeded the Julio-Claudians uh, to the Roman throne uh, during the middle of the war. They uh, in, in 69, they seized the throne and uh, replaced the Julio-Claudians that had all of the famous Caesars like Nero and Augustus and Caligula and Julius Caesar. And so they replaced them, and then following the war, they created this um, really kind of uh, ludicrous version of Jewish scripture, um, and it's just on its face pretty easy to see that they are uh, a strong candidate for the authorship because all of Jesus' prophecies are about their military victories, and we know that uh, victors often write history, and uh, this the Gospels were a, uh, an example of that. They simply record the Roman military victories or the Flavian family's military victories 
but as prophecies. Jesus says that the Galilean towns will be crushed, uh, Jerusalem will be encircled, the temple will be raised, uh, the abomination that Daniel envisioned occurs, will occur. Um, and these are all things that the, um, uh, the Flavian Caesars actually brought about. Okay, and- so I'm sorry to sound uh, ignorant here, but is this a body of scholarly work that's shared and understood and accepted, or is this your own pioneering? All, all of this is completely understood. There's, okay. no, there's no controversy about it. I mean, when Jesus predicts the encircling of Jerusalem that will occur, you know, uh, in 40 years, um, when he talks about the Galilean towns being crushed, when he talks about uh, the temple being raised, uh, these are all events from the war, and in fact, they could only be events from the war because these things only occurred once, and uh, uh, so he's talking about the coming war. In fact, a real easy way to, to see the connection between Jesus and the war uh, is to recognize that Jesus is the Passover lamb of the new covenant, the old covenant, the covenant that originally established the relationship between God and the Israelites, had a Passover lamb, or a Passover and was followed by 40 years of wandering uh, in the wilderness before they could uh, go into um, what was Israel, where there would be this change of ownership, and now this uh, Israel area would be uh, uh, owned by the uh, the chosen people of God, according to the uh, Old Testament. So um, now when you look at Jesus, you see that uh, he is a Passover. In fact, the whole symbolic framework of the Gospels is based on this key symbol that Jesus is going to be the Passover lamb of the new covenant. Uh, The book is often translated as New Testament, but in fact, the word is more accurately translated as covenant. So it's the new covenant. In other words, Jesus and his religion are replacing the old covenant uh, between God and the Israelites. And so now, uh, if you look at the dating of the um, of Jesus relative to the war, you can see that the 40-year cycle is precisely in place where Jesus is crucified on Passover 33 and then on Passover 73, 40 years exactly, uh, Masada falls and the war concludes. So there is a perfect 40-year cycle between in in the uh, in the new covenant between the Passover and the um, uh, the forty conclusion of the forty years where there is a transfer of uh, ownership and in this case it goes in the new covenant from the Israelites to the Romans the uh, the physical ownership of Judea so a cycle like that couldn't occur accidentally it has to be uh, deliberately created and it has to be written after the fact. Right? Okay, so, you, so when if I could just break in here, sure. uh, and I, I'd like you to just answer my uh, questions, which uh, may reflect great his, weak, weakness in this history, but I don't care. I'm sure other people have that too. <laughs> yeah. So if the Flavian Caesars wrote all this, you could call it revised history, and then propagated it as the New Testament or religious belief. Well, I, if, if it was born in written form, how was it moved into the culture? Was it in a written form at first, or in an oral form, or how? You know, it probably, and I can only conjecture, it probably was in an oral tradition, because uh, the number of Christian churches that are described, uh, you know, in the first century are, are, in my opinion, far more than they would have produced copies. Um Rome had what was called the imperial cult. It was the largest bureaucracy in the empire. and was completely designed to promote the Caesar as a god. Um, and so this would have been the agency that would have basically brought Christianity to the masses or would have tried to in the first century, in the early part of the second century. It would have been the imperial cult, the, the priests, and there were tens of thousands of them. They would have just taken a few of them and told them to start talking up a pacified Jewish Messiah. I don't think they would have had a, a copy of the Gospels. Uh, they w- would have had just a general story. And uh, and this is one of the reasons why, after the fact, uh, there were like various texts written that are kind of uh, like the Gospel story, but not exactly perfect. And uh, they, they started to circulate in the second century. And it's just because 
they would have had priests with some verbal understanding of the story, the version of Judaism that uh, the Romans wanted to uh, promote, but uh, they certainly wouldn't have wasted, uh, uh, you know, like the the cost of pr- creating, you know, thousands of these uh, of these texts to just go out and tell the story to slaves because the people they were trying to convert were basically illiterate, uh, weren't weren't people with a lot of uh, mental skills, and so they they probably didn't think they needed to have a lot of precise. Uh, theology about Christ uh, handed to them, and, and uh, in fact, uh, the Gospels themselves are so arcane; I, no one could even understand them. You know, I mean, I mean even today, you know, uh, Christians who read the texts have no real understanding of what they mean. So, um, I think that uh, if you want to look where the uh, the attempt to promote Christianity came from, it came through the imperial cult, but. You have to remember that Christianity was really uh, pretty much a failure. Um, they didn't head off the rebellions. Um, the uh, the Gospels would have been written, say, between uh, the year 80 and 100, perhaps. And um, following that uh, time, uh, very shortly after that, around 115, you have what's called the uh, Kittos Rebellion, which was a a rebellion of the Messianic Jews, and this was um, just a catastrophic kind of rebellion. Um, they gained the Jews gained control over the island of Cyprus, uh, and they uh, genocided the entire Gentile population, which was recorded at two hundred forty thousand. Um, they gained control of Cyrenia uh, and uh, depopulated it. Evidently, there was just another extermination of the Gentiles. And then they got into Egypt where they drove uh, the Roman legions out of Alexandria, which is just an amazing achievement because this was the breadbasket of Rome and would have been defended to the end. But there are actually letters of the Roman magistrates that they found uh, as they tried to escape down the Nile to uh, deeper into Africa. So that rebellion lasted... Really, it, it never really ended. It just kind of simmered. Uh, Rome got a control over the area. Um, they brought their legions into where they thought the rebellions might uh, might spring up again. But then in 133, it popped back up. And this time uh, in Judea, the Bar Kokhba rebellion. Bar Kokhba means son of the star. It's a reference to the star prophecies or messianic prophecies, which are the prophecies that Jesus Christ ascribes to himself uh, to indicate that he has a, a claim on the Messianic title. And so Bar Kokhba got going, he drove Rome out, and uh, they established a nation-state right in the middle of the Roman Empire, and Rome brought all of its legions to bear. They eventually defeated the, um, the rebellion, and um, it was an absolute bloodbath and a complete disaster for Rome. Um, okay, I need you to pause for a minute sure. and help me to sort this out. So the Romans created this messianic oh, f- re- religion belief system to quell the rebelling Jews. Well, they, were, they wanted to give an alternative to the messianic movement. Yes, I uh, understand. I and understand so they wanted that. to give a, a, a messianic movement because these these prophecies. Okay, so at that time the Romans were pagans. Yeah. And they cooked up this idea. They said, "Well, we'll calm these people down. We'll offer them a Messiah that will placate them and 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 turn them into a they're already simple. When you refer to the illiterate simple people, you're talking about the Jewish forces or the other pagans? Both. Um the um Jews were spread throughout the Roman Empire and uh, would have been um, subject to missionary activities. Um, we know because the uh, Roman, Roman court historian Josephus gives us the information, he says that, that Rome was most afraid of the um, movement spreading to the Jews that lived uh, in the diaspora, in the, inside the general Roman Empire. And so... The um, uh, the the real 
uh, focus of the uh, of Christianity, in my opinion, in the in the first century and beginning of the second century, wasn't to the Messianic zealots. They knew they couldn't really convert them, but they were hoping to establish an alternative uh, to the missionary activity that would have been throughout the Roman Empire. In which, which way was the missionary activity going? It was the. It would have been coming from Judea oh. out into the Roman provinces. Um, there were, they don't have precise data on this, but some people have said that the Jewish population was as much as 15% of the Roman Empire, and it was completely dispersed throughout it. So after um, the catastrophic war of 66-73, the Flavians concocted Christianity with the idea that if they put it into these uh, outlying areas, the Jews of the diaspora, of their diaspora, uh, first century, would not then um, be tempted by the Messianic literature that uh, or, uh, you know, promotional activity. That would have been um, what they were afraid of. Mm-hmm. I get it now. Okay. So... Uh, let's, we can even jump forward a little bit and assume that at some point this um, effort became successful in this thing called Christianity, which now I'll put in quotes because it was an invention, right. um, began to spread and people began to believe in this Jesus of the New Testament, which was really the New Covenant, um, and they uh, settled down and they became a slave class. This is the, you said to me once that this was all done to create a feudalistic population, a servile population. Right. Well, what happens is the, uh, the original purpose of Christianity, which is to slow down the militaristic Messianic movement, is no longer in effect following the Bar Kokhba Rebellion because basically at that point they'd actually crushed it. Um, they basically banned uh, Jews from Israel and uh, Hadrian simply drove them out. Um, and this is the beginning of the diaspora. So between, say, 150 and 300, um, there really isn't a whole lot known about Christianity. It doesn't have a, uh, a, a need or doesn't fulfill a need of the Roman Empire because the, the Messianic military movement has been defeated. Um, it comes back to life in 304 with Constantine, who was a Flavian. His name is Flavius Constantinus. Um, and even though they don't actually have genealogic records, I suspect he's a family member. He certainly uses the family name. And, uh, and Constantine then begins a process to make it the state religion. So this is a completely different um, goal for Christianity, and it has to do with the feudal system. Um, Constantine gets this positive legacy because he took us out of paganism, so-called, and produced Christianity as Rome's state religion. Um, and, and this is true to some extent. He didn't actually make it the state religion, but he began the process by which it became the state religion because he gave um, Christians the power of Rome's military to back them up. You couldn't resist any longer um, the uh, Christians setting up churches, and they had uh, kind of a superior place in the Roman theology, and then within a few years, suddenly they started to destroy the other religions' temples. And then after a while, after about 70 years and a couple Caesars, suddenly it was made the state religion, and you had to be Christian. So Constantine began this process, and um, the fact that um, uh, most people simply don't bring into uh, understanding Constantine's purpose for Christianity is the fact they don't recognize his other edicts. Constantine issued the uh, so-called Edict of Milan, which gave Christianity the power of the military, but he also issued a series of edicts which set up the feudal system. In other words, at the same time that he uh, began the process of making Christianity the state religion, he issued edicts which took away all ownership rights from uh, the Roman populations. You couldn't own land, 
you couldn't leave the land you were born on. You couldn't change the vocation. You had to have the same vocation that your father or mother had. Your children could be sold by the magistrates if they decided to populate some other area. And the uh, product of the farmland that you had could uh, be taken over by Rome. So this outlined and detailed the feudal system. And the feudal, the primary component of the feudal system would have been the serf. And that's just a, another word for slave. Serf means slave. And so Constantine set up the feudal system to work in conjunction with Christianity. Christianity gave his slave system a religious context. And it's very obvious when you look at all of these other edicts what the purpose of Christianity was. It was to try and get the slave to believe that God was responsible for his condition, and therefore there was no reason to rebel because a kind of worker's paradise would exist for the serf once he passed away and went to heaven. So this was using Christianity as mind control. Uh, it was to take away the desire to rebel. And in place of the um, passion for rebellion that uh, people experience when they're enslaved, they had the passion for Jesus. And this uh, system worked very well. Um, worked for 1,500 years, more or less. Um, the slaves were accepting their plight as uh, uh, inferior individuals that God had for some reason placed as uh, farm workers that, who didn't own anything. And uh, they were given Jesus, who they evidently uh, had these uh, worship feeling for. And uh, so the system worked just great for the imperial families, for the patrician class, for the, uh, the ruling families. And um, what has happened is, is that the, uh, the title that Caesar held of Pontiff Maximus um, was given to the Pope. The Pope's actual legal designation is Pontiff Maximus. And so the, um, the Caesar had simply changed titles so that the slave would not see him any longer as a military leader and an enslaver, but rather as a religious figure, a Pontiff Maximus who was representing Jesus. Now, all of this, I would guess, has had has been the product of careful analysis, right? I mean, this isn't written out. There are documents and there are records that uh, back all this up. But right, I mean, all someone of someone has had to analyze all this. Yeah, and it's funny that that this isn't just sort of the straightforward way history is understood because. Um, the uh, the relationship between the so-called edicts against the Coloni that uh, Constantine created to set up the feudal system are well known. Constantine is well understood by all historians to have created the feudal system. Um, and he is also known to have begun the uh, process of making Christianity the state religion. Well, um, why aren't they part of the same process? It's the only coherent way to look at it because otherwise you'd have to be uh, claiming that, on one hand, Constantine uh, wanted to um, enslave people, but on the other hand, he wanted to embrace Jesus Christ. Makes no sense. Right. So um, uh, the uh, the fact is is that the uh, the, the imperial families uh, controlled Christianity from the beginning, um, and certainly were in in political power and in communication with all of the administration of the, of the Catholic Church, and at the time Constantine made the transition. So naturally, they did it for their benefit. So really, it isn't, um, even though it's not a, a common uh, sort of understanding of, of the uh, purpose of Christianity and as, as a mind control element in the state religion, honest to gosh, Sophia, it's the only clear-minded way to look at the thing. Yeah, no, it makes complete sense, but still it's a little bit hard to grasp because it runs against everything we've been taught, even though most of us have very weak knowledge of this part of history. But there are different, you know, it's kind of a, you have to have spatial thinking to get it because there are these two things that clash and then you have to hold them in a form that links them, which is what you've just explained. 
Yeah, um, what's, 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 uh, just to interrupt, it's what's really effective is that they have been able to make the uh, image of Jesus Christ so iconic. Once Jesus is made to be real, and you believe in all these aspects of him, how much he loves you and cares about you and these philosophical principles that he's espousing, um, you start having an automatic and unconscious association with the individual. And then when information comes forward that uh, negates this and says, you know, the guy's actually uh, been set up as just kind of a hologram to uh, uh, help people enslave the masses, it just uh, cuts across one's understanding uh, and and understanding is used there and I'm using it as a you've been conditioned your mind has a, a mechanical energy to keep the uh, uh, this understanding in place because it's been inputted into it and so uh, Rome was just really good at, at this and and uh, this this technique um, didn't begin with with the Romans I mean it had been used by oligarchs going back as far as we can tell. I mean, uh, Julius Caesar, uh, you know, represented himself as a god. Alexander the Great uh, claimed he was divine. Um, the Ptolemies, when they took over Egypt, took on the divine role of the uh, pharaohs. And so religion just pretty much always has been a device of the oligarchs to make the uh, uh, there are subjects easier to control, and so they won't rebel. And Christianity is just in this long lineage of uh, what's really a very crude technique, but one that uh, works really well. So, Joe, what interested you in this? Was this a product, a byproduct of your own personal belief system and philosophy? Like maybe you were agnostic or atheistic. And no, I, it's really funny. I didn't have any particular issue with Christianity one way or another. Um, what what I was interested in, I suppose, I, just to go back, I studied Christianity when I was a boy and growing up in Japan, and I went to a, uh, a religious school that studied uh, Catholicism and the Gospels and Jesus. And so I had this guy, Jesus Christ, as a strong icon in my mind, and when the Dead Sea Scrolls um, were publicized as being associated with the scandal, in other words, when um, people started wondering why a lot of the scrolls hadn't been uh, released to the public after 40 years, <laughs> um, why hadn't they? And there, was, there started to be speculation it's because they were going to describe um, another Messiah than Jesus, and this would have some negative uh, uh, you know, effect on the historicity of Jesus Christ. So I was curious about that and just started reading about it, and I then discovered that, in fact, uh, the history I, I had been told about the first century was wrong, that uh, there, the Messianic movement that uh, is described in the Gospels wasn't the nationalist movement of Judea, the Messianic movement was a warrior movement. It was, uh, you know, violent, and uh, everything about Jesus seemed unreal. And so um, I tried to understand this, and that meant I needed to read uh, the works of Flavius Josephus. And he's this uh, oddball and really boring uh, historian of the first century, um, and he's the only person that wrote any uh, extant text about the uh, effects of uh, uh, or of things going on in Judea. Who that's 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 actually uh, from the first hand. He was the only one who actually left any history that he actually saw of what went on in Judea in the first century. So everyone has to read him. It kind of goes through him to understand that era. And when I read his works, particularly his history of the war, I saw that there were really strange parallels between uh, things that he described and things that are described in the Gospels. And so I just tried to understand the relationship between what I was reading in Josephus and the Gospels, and that's what led me down this long path where I eventually realized that you, you had this bizarre genre of literature being represented by the Gospels, that the Gospels are in fact a kind of a typologic prefiguration 
and I don't want to put everyone to sleep, but um, it's it's just this uh, it's a genre whereby you know one individual predicts the coming of another individual, and it's very common in Hebraic literature, and it's common in the Messianic literature that Rome was worried about, um, and so they they had created a a version of the uh, Hebraic typology, except in their version. Uh, the hero that's predicted isn't a Jew, but rather the son of man that Jesus is predicting is going to come in the future um, is a Roman Caesar. It's this guy, Titus Flavius. And Can you tell us about Titus Flavius. I was going to ask you to bring him in. Sure. Um, he, okay, go ahead. He's, he's, the, uh, he's the person who actually fulfilled the prophecies that Jesus predicted. He uh, crushed the Galilean towns. He encircles Jerusalem with the wall. He raised the temple. And then he um, brought about what Jesus had predicted, uh, the abomination of desolation. So Titus fulfilled the prophecies that Jesus made. Titus was the son of Vespasian, who was the original Caesar of the Flavian family. Um, Vespasian was deified by the Roman Senate, uh, so he was a god, and uh, this gave title Titus the title the son of God. And when you see the um, the character Jesus and his relationship to his father in the gospel, this is basically just a um, a symbolic representation of the relationship between Titus and his father. If you go to uh, Rome, you'll see the Arch of Titus uh, next to the Colosseum. And on the arch, you'll have a lot of the uh, things that Jesus predicted, the destruction of Jerusalem and these things will be uh, in relief carved onto the um, carved onto the the arch um, and then you'll see an inscription which says that the arch is dedicated uh, from uh, God the Father Vespasian to the Son of God Titus Flavius so so this was the theological lineup that the Flavians had and that's the one that's why they uh, they constructed that uh, situation in the uh, uh, in the Gospels, and it's also why you have the absolute bizarre character, the Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit, uh, in Christianity, because there was in fact uh, two sons, and and so this uh, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost would have been the third Flavian, and they would have been sharing this uh, bizarre Godhead of Christianity, where you have three divine individuals somehow all fitting into into one entity. Um, it's really just a way to represent the Flavians typologically. Um, Which came first, the actual, um, the Gospels or the the events that the Gospels wrote about? The events came first. The um, That's how you write prophecies that come true, is right. you just write them before or after they happen. So all of the events, every single thing in the Gospels, uh, virtually, is uh, representing something that's going to take place 40 years later. So when, you're really saying that early history is recorded in the Gospels yeah, absolutely, as a yeah. prophecy, but it's really done in reverse. The Gospels were written after the early history happened as a record, exactly, as a predictive record. Yeah, the victors write history here. They wrote it as a prophecy. And so Jesus says, you know, the Galilean town is going to get crushed. And he names some of the ones that are going to be actually crushed by the Flavians when they come in. And, and, the, and the, whole, uh, the whole ministry of Jesus is is an exact mirror of the Flavian military campaign. You know, the adult ministry starts in the Sea of Galilee, where Jesus says, you know, you, if you follow me, you're going to become fishers of men. Well, this is where Titus comes to the very location, and he, uh, he gathers his troops together, and he goes, you know, don't be afraid. And then he says, you know, you've got to go out there and attack the uh, Jewish fishing fleet. <laughs> They do, they sink the boats, and then the men attempt to swim to safety, and the Romans catch them like fish, fishing for men, see? So the, the, um, the, the, the Gospels are, they, they have on their service narration a kind of, um, you know, spiritual, kind of abstract nature, but if you actually look at them in terms of the reality of, between the relationship between the ministry of Jesus and the, and the war, they're actually quite comical, it's funny. Um, so Jesus pretends or is seemingly speaking in a spiritual way when he says fishing for men, but in fact it, it predicts something that happens exactly 40 years later at that, at that point because location is, is one of the elements of the, 
the pattern that they set up between Jesus and Titus. So just to, to go on with my thought, the, so Jesus starts at the Sea of Galilee. He goes into the Galilee proper. Then he goes to Jerusalem, where for some period of time he stays outside the city. Then he goes into the city. Then he comes out of the city where he has the crucifixion. Well, this is a mirror of Titus's behavior. I mean, he comes into the Sea of Galilee, then he goes into Galilee proper, then he goes to Jerusalem. He has to be outside the city for a while because this was the period of time when they were basically knocking the walls down. Then he goes into the city, and then um, he uh, comes out, and they have uh, the three crucified where one individual miraculously survives episode Um which is, you know, to, to, to really explain that in detail would, would have would require a long segue. But, but so the entire pattern, the physical movement of Jesus is all based upon the Flavian military campaign, which followed the same course and so sequence. There was always this 40-year spread, but given that so many people were illiterate and it took, that we didn't have, you know, uh, faxes and emails and internet or anything. I mean, everything traveled very slowly. So 40 years was not significant, right? Well, yeah, but the odd thing is the Catholic, Catholic theologians knew about this. And in fact, there was a group of theologians called the Preterites that up to the 19th century were the dominant version, and they were saying that Jesus' predictions were all about the war. They knew there was a 40-year cycle. They knew um, that the events of the war had had been, many of them had been uh, prophesied by Jesus. Um, But they just couldn't take the next step because they were religious and see that the character that Jesus envisions, or he calls the Son of Man, was actually the guy who, who, who worked all of these miracles, who actually did all this stuff, the character Jesus Christ doesn't show up at the war. Mm. He doesn't appear. Um, so they, the Preterites knew, though, that the prophecies were all about uh, the war. And, and the original church fathers, people like Eusebius, who was Constantine, right-hand guy, and our St. Augustine, they wrote all about this. They, they said that uh, the reason that we can believe that Jesus Christ was divine is because he accurately prophesied the events of the war. Yeah, that's very interesting. That's because that's exactly what cements it in the minds of most people, right? Right. Well, it was it was designed to work as a um, evidence of the character's divinity, but it was also supposed to lead people to understand that that the the most important character in the Gospels is not Jesus Christ. It's the character that he predicts is going to come with all of the destruction. Because this individual is greater than Jesus Christ. Jesus actually refers to him, to his power, and to all of these things he's going to do. Now, people have always said, well, he must be talking about himself. But Jesus Christ doesn't come back for the, uh, for the, the sack of Jerusalem. So you need to have uh, someone else suggested as as an individual and there's only one person that can be and that's Titus Flavius he he came and at the right time within the 40 years he worked the miracles Jesus predicted he claimed to be the son of God and he also or at least his court historians claimed that he was the Jewish Messiah they claimed that uh, the um, the prophecies that are Jesus talks about in uh, in the Gospels that they did not foresee a Jewish person, but rather they foresaw Vespasian and Titus, right? So the the relationship between Jesus' predictions and the court historians of the Flavians is very, very precise, that the Jewish Messianic prophecies foresaw the Son of Man who comes during the war, and that's the Flavian Caesar. Mm. So this Titus Flavius, so that's what you mean when you, the description on the back of the DVD where it says that uh, the, the, the whatever, the second coming is, has already happened. Exactly. The um, Wow, and here is everybody is, waiting for something that... Right, thousands right, they're going to be waiting for quite a while because, in fact, it already happened. 
Wow, that's very interesting. Well, Gosh. it's well, useful. Sorry? I was going to say it's useful because a lot of the um, politicians use Christianity as a tool to uh, confuse the population uh, into accepting incoherent political action. Um, specifically, I'm talking about our foreign policy in the Middle East where a lot of people who are Christian believe that they need to have this warfare in the Middle East because that is predicted uh, to be part of what is associated with the return of Jesus to the earth. And so this is obviously a a weak point in the minds of Christians, and it's one that's exploited um, by uh, politicians so that uh, they can gain a fraction of the population to support foreign policy that is not in the interests of the people. So would you say that the people who um, cooked this up, this Christianity, they had a deep understanding of the human psyche and psychology? I mean, this to me smacks of a very advanced uh, strategy. Or is this just so basic to human nature that we shouldn't be surprised that people knew it uh, thousands of years ago? And you said the oligarchs do this kind of thing, but it really seems like genius. Yeah, it is. They they had studied human nature. Um, this was not a subject that was released into into historical records. They kept it to themselves. But if you look at the Gospels closely in, in the right context, you can see that they really knew what they were doing as far as making the character someone that um, the population would love and be uh, influenced by. They knew exactly what they were doing, um, and so the the, uh, the this this technique didn't originate uh, with Jesus. It would have been um, highly developed uh, by the patrician class and, and earlier oligarchs. And so, what what it really amounts to is a kind of weaponized anthropology, where ruling classes study the general population and then come up with techniques that keep them in power. Well, so if we go now to the second phase of this feudalism movement, you have written an essay that has gotten a lot of attention, uh, The Manufacturing of the Deadhead. Yeah. And your discussion with me, in your discussion with me, you, you mentioned that this neo-feudalism is caused by the counterculture strategies. So right. it, it makes sense because we already have Christianity in place and it's, you know, followed by so many millions, billions of people everywhere. And it has certain moral, it has a moral code. And then suddenly comes this counterculture movement that has the exact opposite moral code and is defying this whole Christian um this rock solid Christian tradition. And so tell us how that creates the new slave class. Well, it's a kind of a long story, but um, I, I was often asked about uh, Neo Christianity, the modern version. And that uh, has a lot of associations with uh, new age theology, um, New World Order sorts of concepts, and I was constantly being asked, because I was uh, seen as a critic of Christianity, though I'm not sure I really uh, would have uh, characterized myself in that, as that way, but that's what, that's what they wanted to know, and so I was asked about it. And I, I could determine that the uh, kind of the origin of the neo-Christianity was this book called A Course in Miracles. Um, and a Course in Miracles was uh, created by two individuals, um, Schumann and Thetford. And when I studied them, I was astounded to learn that they were a cognitive psychologist, and they both worked for an organization called MKUltra, which is a CIA project that had to do with basically studying uh, the uh, how to control human behavior uh, mental control, drugs, uh, torture, different things like this. And so this just struck me as being a little bit 
suspicious. And so when I went into, um, uh, you know, the, the Course in Miracles and uh, um, this MK Ultra organization, I started to learn um, that it had odd connections into um, what was called the counterculture. And I knew that Christianity had been originally used by Constantine to debase the intellect, right? If you get the serf to believe in Jesus, then he won't think about um, the rationale behind rebellion and how much more logical it would be to rebel than to obey. So when I looked at MKUltra, even though it had been publicized as having been more or less designed to produce individual assassins, that's the most famous aspect of it. A guy named John Marx had written a book called The Manchurian Candidate, uh, which was seemingly exposing MKUltra about how they would take an individual and could condition him to uh, respond to certain stimulus and then assassinate people. Well, um, studying it, I saw that actually it was more on a broad social scale. And and what I started to see were connections between the rock and roll, the beginning rock and roll um, movements, and, uh, and MKUltra, um, specifically uh, Grateful Dead. Um, Robert Hunter, the lyricist, had, um, had been a, a, an employee of MKUltra, and oddly enough, Ken Kesey, uh, who worked with the Grateful Dead to uh, produce these acid tests, had also been an MKUltra employee. And then strange patterns started to appear when I started to study this further, and, and I found that uh, Stanley Osley, the uh, individual who produced the LSD for the Grateful Dead and for Kesey, he had been, he had admitted himself for three years almost uh, to St. Elizabeth's Hospital, for, apparently for some mental condition, but in fact, this hospital was one of the uh, uh, the ones that conducted the MK Ultra training and experimentation. Um, and so, I started to read a guy named Colin Ross. He's a psychiatrist. He had done a lot of research into MK Ultra because he had been tasked with trying to help people who had been exposed to their experimentations, the experimentation that MKUltra did, particularly in Canada, where he's a psychiatrist. And uh, and so uh, then um, I began to communicate with Jan Irwin, who was basically on the same track. Um, and I won't explain you know, how his trajectory worked, but we came kind of to the same conclusion that the counterculture was deliberately created, that... Um, uh, the uh, the Grateful Dead, the Beatles, uh, the Laurel Canyon music scene that erupted in Los Angeles, all of these things that promoted LSD and um, kind of mentally dropping out, turn on, tune in, drop out, that this was a an organized effort, that it was um, related to um, the idea of creating an easier to control population. It was actually just a giant experiment in crowd control conducted by the CIA. Um, now, I, I started to, um, to look at where does the anthropology come from that uh, MKUltra was using, and this is when it all became clear to me. I found that there was an individual named Gregory Bateson, famous anthropologist, father, or excuse me, husband of Margaret Mead. And there was a guy named Dr. David Price who wrote a, a great book called Weaponizing Anthropology, which is, that's where I get the phrase when I use it, I'm borrowing it from him. Um, and he showed that Bateson, even though Bateson is famous as a humanist, a Buddhist, uh, you know, someone who took a lot of LSD purportedly uh, found help found Esalon, uh, you know, where there's the sex and uh, free love and free thinking, supposedly. And he's this famous anthropologist. But Price had found something else about him. He found, using the Freedom of Information Act, a letter in which Basin lays out the techniques of anthropologic science that the governments can use, and the, and the letter that, that uh, Price is referencing is written by Bateson 
to the uh, head of the OSS, which becomes the CIA, right? So it's it's written to military intelligence. And he says, look, you know, he says, we can control these people. I'm, I'm just going to roughly paraphrase. But he says that he references um, to have the most stable slave society. And I'm, I'm going to... You, you, just for sake of brevity, use broad stroke here. But for the sake, but he says, look, to have a more effective, you know, kind of col- colonial state, you need to establish what he calls a native revival. And he says, this is how you can keep the populations from uh, uh, worrying about having uh, inferior technology and to accept their place as an inferior population inferior people. And he, this I'm quoting, he said, uh, to, to have a superior people control an inferior people, you need to have the inferior people experience a native or archaic revival. In other words, you've got to make them think that what was in their past was the, the, the best life. And this is where they really want to go. They want to go into their folkloric tradition, their dance, their appearance, um, and and in the and, and Bateson references experiments. Amazing. He, he references experiments that had been done by the Russians on their Asiatic Indian populations that had determined all this. Now these experiments that he references are not available to the population. Can't find them anywhere except in his the letter obtained by the Freedom of Information Act. But the Russians had conducted these experiments, and this population that they found that they could they could enslave them more easily by making them embrace their past, this native revival, this was where the term shaman come from. Shaman isn't an American term. It doesn't come from the Americas. It comes from Asia. This was a culture that had it, and that culture in the past had used the psilocybin mushroom. So this was part of what they wanted to embrace, this primitive music, drugs, kind of uh, high priest sort of uh, characters, and that this would make them um, feel good about themselves while the superior people were developing technology, weapons, slave control. So anyway, looking at that and then looking at the work of MKUltra, and reading this guy, Dave McGowan, who had done work into the Laurel Canyon um, music scene where he found that so many of the uh, rock and roll stars were the sons of military intelligence uh, and uh, chemical warfare um, scientists, he just found this amazing pattern of this keep over and over again. All these individuals were fitting into it. Um, it, it seemed to me to be very clear that what had happened was they conducted this vast experiment to see if they could take uh, the baby boomer uh, in the mid-60s, this large population glut, and move them into a um, native revival. And they used um, rock stars to make them see the native revival as something that was beneficial and desirable. And so if you look at the original rock and roll guys, you can see that they're very primitive in appearance. Um, you know, David Crosby, for example, wearing the buckskin fringe, and he looks like something out of the Lewis and Clark expedition. But this had, so this was a, you know, a kind of a paranoid theory that I was, um, I believed in. Um, and then, there was evidence. Um, Colin Ross had discovered that the original trip that set off the psychedelic drugs in the United States, which was conducted by a guy named Gordon Wasson, had in fact been an MK Ultra subproject. He actually got the documents, and they exist, and we present them in the, the, the paper manufacturing the data. And those documents show that the the trip to Mexico that is so glowingly described in Life magazine was subproject 58 of MK Ultra, and that Bateson actually had pay um, requests directly to MK Ultra um, for his activity there. Now, um, 
this was the beginning of the psychedelic awareness and movement in the United States. And it is not possible that the first introduction of this drug uh, into the American consciousness would come from this tiny organization. And then also the original rock and roll groups would also have this direct connection to it. This wouldn't be accidental. So this was, in my opinion, just absolutely clear evidence. Now, if you look at the uh, Life magazine um, cover, which describes this psilocybin adventure that Gordon Wasson goes on, you'll see that it has a glowing little description of uh, fantastic visions in the Mexican desert. And then underneath it, it has another article that's described with just three words, teenage allowances, right? So that is not possible to be circumstance. This is a clever sort of auto-suggestion device that goes all the way back to the 1957 article that Life magazine ran on Gordon Wasson, which um, is basically setting up what they knew would be the teenage allowance of, of psychedelic drugs. And so, um, you know, it's a very sad story. Very sad. It was never vetted. They, the Church Commission did uh, investigation and, and found that uh, MK Ultra had been doing experiments on unwitting humans. In other words, the same thing that was going to occur with the entire youth culture in the, in the late 60s. They had been doing all these experiments on unwitting um, victims. They would give LSD to people who didn't know they were being given the drug. And this, of course, was in San Francisco, right? Um, but Alan Dulles, head of the CIA, decided that the information in MKUltra was too explosive and he destroyed it. It's the only reason we even have the documents we do, which are not, uh, you know, uh, they're estimated like they're 10% of the total amount of information, is just because they were accidentally uh, put in some place a copy of them, and this was when discovered, and that, and that leaked into the public, and this has led to our understanding uh, today. So it's um, it's a very sad and and, uh, and disturbing story because the CIA should have during the Church Commission, if they wanted to stop this activity, they should have come clean. But the fact that they didn't uh, indicates that they are continuing, and that obviously at this point we're probably dealing with um, with other techniques of uh, population control. Um, I think. Um, uh, I've said in, in many times that, you know, I'm very worried about two things in our media. One is all of these zombie movies that they have produced, because I think that this could be normalizing uh, kind of an apocalyptic plague or some sort of uh, uh, thing that uh, illness, sickness, vaccine, or something that uh, could be used to reduce the population dramatically. Um and this could be kind of a, you know, a normalization of the concept. And I'm also concerned by all of the survivor shows. I mean, if you look at television, there's a, these dozens of these, you know, survivors, uh, you know, dual survivor. And now they even have uh, Naked and Afraid, where they take a couple with no clothes and drop them in some wilderness area and let them just see if they can survive for 21 days. And they call it Naked and Afraid. And I, I think that this you know, is in fact, uh, unfortunately, a kind of preparation, a mental preparation to normalize um, what the government would like to see. Uh, they really want to see a kind of delta uh, non-technologic population or, or one that they can move in that direction as far as possible. And so this is why you, they, they, uh, they assist in the production of all these kinds of shows. Well, um you had mentioned that the LSD experiments were the sort of crux of this manufacturing of a... Uh, a deadhead. Yeah, a de the deadhead. A, 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 I mean, they in their own way were kind of zombified, right? And well, yeah, I don't really know. You know, um, Terrence McKenna, who actually wrote a book called The Native 
archaic revival, I think, and where he describes, you know, returning to the a feudal system as a good idea. And um, in, in, in tapes, he talks about, you know, where he's, you know, working, you know, for some kind of agency and he's, you know, they're, they're very mysterious thing, but he promoted what he called a heroic dose where people would take this massive amount of, I believe it's ayahuasca and I'm not familiar. I don't use these drugs and I haven't read his books, but I just seen an excerpt from it. So he, he, he promotes this, what he calls heroic dose. But then later it was determined that he didn't take psychedelic drugs. See, it, it's what I would call a lifetime. He was a lifetime actor. And this is the phrase that I think, you know, has to go along with weaponizing or weaponized anthropology. There's two phrases I would love to see enter the public lexicon. I just wish everybody knew about them and used them and, and just, you know, it was just a normal idea. Weaponized anthropology um, and lifetime actor. And a really good example of a lifetime actor is Gordon Wasson, Gregory Bateson. I mean, Bateson representing himself as this humanist, right? So you just have this wonderful kind of thing on one hand. On the other hand, he's writing uh, details how to have a more effective slave state. I think if you look at the Grateful Dead, you'll see that you have connections to MK Ultra and also into the Bohemian Grove. I think at least two of the members are have admitted that they are members of the secret society. And I think that that's um, telling. And I think that that suggests that, look, you are dealing not with some, you know, someone who, who is honest in his present rep- public representation, but rather, you know, uh, someone who's involved with the oligarchs. And, and he just has this um, actor persona because that makes the propaganda effective in black propaganda, which was the, science that Gregory Bateson was developing in World War II. In black propaganda, the critical thing is trust. The the victim of the black propaganda has to trust that the person who is giving him the information is sincere and trustworthy. You see, so this is where the lifetime actor concept comes from, is they had to create personas that would be trusted by the uh, the population that would be the victim. So the Grateful Dead come across as these filthy but lovable um, primitive individuals with love and everything, and of course they're giving away hundreds of thousands of tabs of LSD for free. Now where do they come up with the dough to do that? But they never seem to get arrested, but they just keep having these tours, the drugs keep going out. Well, I look at them as lifetime actors. That's my my understanding of them. Um, when I look at Gordon Wasson and his claims of, about the, the drugs, I'm sure I'm dealing with lifetime actors. Same is true with Basin. But another person who's obviously a lifetime actor is Aldous Huxley. Huxley goes on Mike Wallace, and it's a famous YouTube interview where he talks about how worried he is that the governments will one day have drugs that can control their populations. He's so worried about this. Well, if you go into his work and in the background of all of the scientists doing it, doing the, the experiments for MK Ultra, you can see that this guy was actually involved in all of these experiments and the, the research to assist government to have these kinds of tools. So he denies it. He creates this plausible deniability image where he goes on and says how worried he is about it. But then at the other hand, he's the person actually developing the technology. So this is the lifetime actor. It's, it's someone who takes on a persona to come in front of the public, to come into the controlled media, to produce um, propaganda that will be believed because the person is seen as trustworthy by the victims. So that's why, you know, weaponizing anthropology, the oligarchs study humans to learn how to enslave them. And lifetime actor, the critical uh, element in their uh, um, control uh, and then their effective use of black propaganda is that they create these trustworthy individuals to promote, uh, in, in the case of the counterculture, to promote um, primitive lifestyles and LSD. 
I mean, you look at Jim Morrison, you know, he's uh, writing about the crystal ship and all his promotion about LSD and supposedly he's taking it every day. And, and uh, you know, he, he's leading people into the archaic revival, into the, the drug use and the primitive uh, lifestyle. He claims that uh, he was at a, some kind of a car accident when he's a kid and an Indian was dead and the Indian spirit got into him. You know, these are these are the stories. This this makes him trustworthy and believable. But on the other side, his father is Admiral Morrison. Now, this guy is in charge of the uh, naval uh, activity. He's an admiral in charge of the naval activity that was the Gulf of Tonkin episode. Right. 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 So now that's the other side. That's that. To me, this is the reality you have on one side. You have the actor. On the other hand, when you start to dig in, you see the truth. Right. I mean, it could always be argued that the kid rebelled and he went the opposite way, but I don't think that's the case. But what I was getting at earlier when I said that the turn on, um, turn on, tune in, drop out, uh, that is a that's a Grateful Dead uh, slogan, right? It okay. comes from it comes from Timothy Leary, and it was created for him by Marshall McLuhan. Um, the specialist in uh, media control of populations. Okay, but it was employed in the rock and roll movement. Sure. And by lifetime actors, as you say. But that in itself was pushing people into a zombified state. Because if you turn on, you tune in, and you drop out, that's what you are. You're not engaged. And so I think that when you mentioned the, you know, um, proliferation of these zombie movies... If I can liken it to some of my own thinking and work, um, we are being neurologically destroyed very systematically and are, we already have brain fog. I mean, I, how many times do I go upstairs, downstairs, and I cannot even remember what I came upstairs or downstairs for and I have to do it all over again. Um, and then I remember. So everybody has some kind of amnesia operating all the time and we're just not concentrating well. And these are all also, uh, this is part and parcel of our culture. We're interrupted so much that we can't really do anything without even interrupting ourselves because that's the way that we work now. But overall, given the assault by vaccines, the uh, neurological destruction by radiation of all sorts, wireless in particular, which is now our constant companion, we are de- decaying. We are falling apart. We are degenerating. And there will be probably a great number of people who will malfunction very badly um, in this regard and will be not able to, you know, take care of themselves. And maybe they will be referred to as the zombie class. It won't just be a drug-induced or, you know, having your mind in another place because we don't live in our present world anymore. We're always living in what I call the second dimension. I see people driving. I saw a truck driver. He had a flatbed tow truck yesterday. And he was zipping so fast between red lights, just barreling, accelerating this very heavy, large truck with a bad brake system because it made horrible noise every time he stopped. And I finally pulled up next to him. And do you know what he had been doing? Texting the whole time. Sure. Sure. Yeah. And this was why he wasn't paying any attention to his driving. And he didn't care because he was in this other world, this 2D world. Um, and I think that, so our whole, the way we operate in our lives is going to change. And some of us will be sick enough that we will be zombified. Others of us will be distracted, distracted enough, you know. And then the survivor issue, yes, is going to be, a necessity we're going to have to struggle through this and if they cut our amenities if there are you know calamities and we're all herded into the agenda 21 tiny little uh, habitats and apparently our sub- suburban roads are all destined to go to gravel so we won't drive our cars and you know we're going to be in a mode of despair people are going to end up desperate clawing each other perhaps maybe they'll turn on each other sure that's all quite possible yeah so 
the I guess in some ways the neo feudalism, <laughs> as you mentioned or discussed, refers to people who are content to live simply and in primitive ways and are thereby um, m- more easily governed. Uh, I mean, if you're susceptible to one trend, you're probably going to be susceptible to another one too. You know, you'll just take the trends as they are imposed on you. But um, it seems to me that there's also a push toward death destitution, e- economic destitution. Sure, of course. Well, I mean, the um, the world of the future as envisioned by the oligarchs could well be the one in, uh, you know, that is uh, shown in Naked Survivor where, uh, you know, to make fire you have to rub sticks together, no one has any clothes, food is, of course, you've got to go out and try to beat a baboon to death or something, you know, to eat it. Um, yeah, the um, the future, you know, it, it doesn't look bright and, you um, the um, uh, what I hope is that um, because of the internet and because now there is some potential for um, uh, the the people to have information. Um, you know, we've we've been subjected to a control media from the very beginning, from the very beginning of television. I think from radio as well. I mean, it's these things have been crafted to. Uh, implement control and to dumb down to create a delta class that's easily controlled. So we have suffered and um, the effects that, uh, you know, from the chemicals and from the, the uh, miseducation and from so many things, you know, we, we've uh, been weakened and attacked. And, and now there is the Internet and um, the hope, whatever degree it is, um, is that now people will um, abandon the uh, mainstream media, the control media, and start to use the Internet for information. And this is healthy in so many ways, and one of them is that uh, because of the different um, perspectives on events, people will start to be forced to think about them. And then hopefully the... um, one of the things that has been taken away from us, uh, the uh, which is logical thinking, will will start to come back. Um, you know, I, I I believe that um, one of the religious elements that that could exist would have to do with our own senses and with basically with logical thought. I think that would have been kind of the religion of the oligarchs in the ancient days. I'm not sure about this, but that's my opinion. And it would be wonderful to have this return at this point because we really need to stop being bamboozled. You know, the, the, the false flags, the, uh, the terror events, the, uh, um, you know, the, the terror uh, um, organizations, you know, that are, I mean, these things should be able to be subjected to a scrutiny by individuals uh, that is uh, based in reason and logic and evidence. And um, th- if, if that was done, then they wouldn't have the effect that the government wishes for them to have upon us. So, so this, was, this was kind of a natural thing. And I, I just wanted to mention that it's encouraging to see uh, some of the statistics indicating that there's been a real exodus from mainstream media, that more and more people are using the Internet to get information. They don't turn on CNN, Bloomberg, Fox News, CS, CBS, these kinds of stuff. They're looking to the Internet. And it's also, um, I wanted to compliment you. Um, you have really done a great job of bringing a new information, new thinking to people. Uh, ideas they wouldn't have had about so many things. And I would say that I would hope uh, that, you know, a hundred people would, um, uh, you know, accept your influence and copy what you do. They would try to, to um, you know, assist in the, uh, in the production of the information into the Internet um, and, and, and other places, too. We have to not just use the Internet. Um, we need to go into the streets and uh, not to have, commit violence, which I think would just be insane, but rather to organize politically. 
the the activity that we need to engage in is political organization. Uh, we need to create a political party that represents us and not simply the oligarchs. So there is strength in numbers, you know, um, you and, and, and people like myself, you know, we are, um, at risk in a sense because, uh, we produce information that, uh, is not something that the oligarchs want in to be out in the public. Um, but if there are too many of us to uh, to control, then then they have to try something else, and and that's kind of what um, I hope happens. I hope that uh, you know people, if they read Caesar's Messiah or my new book uh, Shakespeare's Secret Messiah, uh, that these would be seen as uh, they think the analysis is meaningful. That that this would be seen as a, something that would get them into the street, and there what I hope they do is political activity. We need a new political party. Um, we need organization. And a lot of the tools are in place. The situation has interesting possibilities right now because obviously the social networks were designed to enslave us, but they can now be used against the oligarchs because they would permit massively, um, uh, you know, massive exchanges of information among large group and, to have um, organizations set up where where information could be uh, you know uh, exchanged very quickly. I mean, for example, say there was a suspicious terrorist activity in one city, and in that city there were thousands of individuals that were used to analyzing and reporting uh, information that they came up with, and this then became the source of information for the public. Um, if it was found that uh, there was a suspicion in back of the activity, then this could create political energy. We could see that, wait a second, we're being attacked, and to since we are attacked, we need to defend ourselves. And the only way to do that is through creating a strong political counteract. Yeah, you know, I, I hope people can get themselves together and uh, work in a kind of cohesion to counter all this but i think that what's needed first and foremost is a whole new consciousness you know and then to put that consciousness into motion so the internet certainly helps there's so much infiltration into um good information and it's, it can be converted just by somebody repeating it in a slightly different form it can be converted into bad information or disinformation or controlled information, opposition information. I don't know. It's very tricky, Joe. And I I couldn't agree more, but I just think that it's at this point, we need to take some chances. And, um, you know, so I, I am in, I, I promote and I'm in favor of, uh, trying to have uh, political active action. I also think as far as, you know, creating a, you know, a, a new understanding, a new consciousness. I'm completely in favor of that too. I, I just hope they're not exclusive and that uh, both things can occur and, and quickly. Right. And if people can, you know, for instance, get your film, I believe the website is Caesars Messiah Doc. Dot com. Do you yeah, or go to caesarsmessiah.com and you'll you'll end up at the same place. And yeah, the, the the documentary is very easy to watch. It was made by Fritz Heed, who's a I think a really talented uh, filmmaker, and it's it's not unpleasant. Uh, people typically have real good experiences with it, so you can get good information there. Um, and uh, you know, just uh, to, to it, it, the purpose of the books really is just to create an interest in uh, the, the possibility of a different history having occurred. Uh, oh, sure, the likelihood that a different history occurred. Right. What I liked about your film was it wasn't really intrusive. It was, um, you know, it was what it was, and it was very thoroughly presented in a very high-quality production. And I offer it to people as food for thought. Just think about this and really take it in. Right, and I, that's what I would say too. And you know, I just hope that they would take it in as food for thought, and it would just be part of what propels us um, to a new consciousness and to uh, um, a different uh, political direction. Yeah, we're going to have to go in layers here, in sta- steps and stages. But right. the first stage is 
evaluating what you've grown up with and what you've, you know, adopted as yours when it wasn't even your belief system. It came through your parents and all your antecedents and you just accepted it, you know. And that, and to see that that is really a kind of restrictive model that we have grown up in. The whole, uh, the, I guess, what's the, the word for religion? The, there's another, it's almost like edicts or the... Oh, it's a faith system, you know. Or yeah. A, uh, just, it, it's just a, uh, it's a, um, it, it, it's a system of understanding your position in the world um, that was created by people who have uh, ill intent in terms of uh, your freedom and uh, your thinking ability. Yeah, you know, I even looked at prayer in um, the recent past and realized that when you pray to have something changed in your life, you're you're ask, you're beseeching something outside yourself to change what's going on with you. But why don't we try to change it ourselves? Why don't we say, okay, if the control is in me. I can't just get on my knees and externalize my own power like this, you know? Sure. I mean, I mean, if you can get someone to pray, you've got them. Because right. their, their minds are so um, irrational that uh, they can, they're essentially defenseless against uh, oligarchs who are using weaponized anthropology. I mean, just look at the difference. Look at someone who's on their knees with the fate system, and then look at the oligarchs with their scientific understanding of human psychology and their ability to affect the chemicals that are going into this individual's body and uh, his belief in history. I mean, so it isn't a fair fight. And the first thing you have to do is get off your knees and start using your mind. Um, so the change in consciousness can take on it many, many different directions. But the first step is getting off your knees and starting to realize that you have to think and act to protect yourself. Right. And that sometimes very, you know, w what seems like coincidence or miracles, they can occur regardless. And you can attribute them to whatever you want. But just by getting off your knees doesn't mean that all of the magic is gone, you know, that now you're going to have to enact every single step here and no one is going to help you. There's still a confluence that's possible. Sure. You just take responsibility and you don't want to have it based in someone else's ideology because when you're dealing with religions, it is ideology. It's, it's a, a faith system concocted by someone who you don't know and uh, uh, you really can't trust and uh, can easily be used to manipulate. So you know, this new consciousness you talk about, I think, is um, a really good idea. And, uh, you know, it, it's not to say that um, you can't um, have a spiritual world. It's just that it has to be one that you participate in and not one that is uh, given to you as a cage. Right. And I was I pulled up the wiki page on A Course in Miracles and I saw that on the right margin where they explain the genre, they put spirituality, subject, forgiveness. And I'm thinking, what? Why is it forgiveness? And then I realized that all of this New Age psychology is about accepting and allowing and forgiving and not resisting. That's really at the core of it, you know? Sure. Um, Course in Miracles um, was handed off to um, an individual named Ken Wapnick, uh, a Catholic priest, of, uh, evidently. And uh, he um, um, actually wrote about the uh, Abu Ghraib uh, torture. Uh, and he said that uh, this was a good example where we have to learn that, uh, you know, that Jesus wants us to overcome and forgive and forget and that, uh, you know, we shouldn't have a strong reaction to it. And this, I think, is just a classic, just textbook example of of how religion can be used to um, to stop people from defending themselves. To actually, it can be used to make people believe that torture is uh, reasonable, and that uh, um, and that emotional response to such things is wrong. Um, you know, the, you notice that they have this new expression that's uh, entering our lexicon, stay calm. 
mm-hmm. stay calm and love, uh, stay calm and carry on, uh, stay calm. I mean, um, I think that this is uh, uh, frightening because it means that there's something coming that we probably don't want to be calm about. So you just have to um, look at the media, look at the uh, the details and information that are coming from these sources that are obviously uh, you know outside of your control, and and be suspicious. Don't let them condition you. Right now, get this. I'm here. The content of a course in miracles. The primary text of the philosophy propounded by A Course in Miracles consists of the 622-page textbook, a 478-page workbook, and an 88-page teacher's manual, all authored by this Helen Shookman, who sensed that she was channeling Jesus Christ. Well, there, it's just a piggyback. Yeah, of course, yeah. It's just They're just trying to update Christian a little bit to get it ready for the modern age. Um, but the oligarchs, I mean... If you then look into who she was employed by while she was having these conversations with Jesus, you'll see it's MK Ultra. Wow, it's pretty amazing. So uh, I think we've given everybody a lot of material to ponder and digest. And I, this is one of those interviews that I think people should listen to more than once because it is pretty uh, rich to say the least. And Joe, you've really plumbed history and you have a great way of letting it roll out, you know, as you explain it. And uh, I'm very grateful to you for this wonderful interview. I will link um, the paper Manufacturing the Deadhead in my uh, description of this show on my aboutthesky.com website slash podcasts. And also a link to Caesar's Messiah, which I think everybody should watch or read the book if you are still in the habit of reading. So, Joe, you are a very interesting scholar and person, and I'm very glad to know you and have been educated by you in this way. Well, I would say exactly the same to you, Sophia. It's, it's uh, you know, we've kind of in the last couple of weeks become um, um, friends, and uh, it's a great pleasure to talk with you, and I'm sure we'll be chatting soon, and uh, thanks so much for having me. Oh, you're very welcome. I know this is going to be a popular show, and I will try to get someone to put these shows on YouTube for me. So anyone out there who's interested in doing that, please uh, contact me. So, Joe, thank you. Um, I am going to share your documentary now with a few more people because everything has been relit in me and this interview as well. So until next time. Bye-bye. Bye.